I've been serving students for 20 years in the United States, and about five years ago, I noticed something very strange. We had been tracking for decades the decline in the number of hours that student, students reported studying in high school and at the university. Uh, this decline over the last 20 years. And then about five, six, seven years ago, it began to rise again. And I was very puzzled. This is high school students, and this is university students at the college. Um, so I began to think about this, and the, the uh, problem uh, that I began to identify was actually staring me in the face at home. I had two teenage children, and they would, after dinner, go to their rooms to study, sit down at their laptops, their computers, have YouTube open, uh, Facebook, text messaging, and by midnight they would say, Dad, I'm not done with my homework yet. I still need to you know, spend another hour at it. And they've been at it for five hours already. Um, the nature of studying for students has changed because now they are distracted in a million ways that they weren't before the innovation of these technologies. Now, this is not really that much of a surprise to me because I'm a former Buddhist monk. And what we've seen emerge out of the last decade of neuroscience research is a real revolution in understanding the nature of mindfulness um, and attentional mechanisms. We understand that there is no true multitasking for the vast majority of people at any rate, and that multitasking really makes us sad and stupid and stressed. And then conversely, that when we are trained to pay attention to our bodies, to the moment, uh, to set aside ruminating thoughts, that we're less depressed, we're more productive, we have less of a tendency to want more and more things, we uh, are less habituated to the positive things in our life, um, and we're actually nicer people, we're more tolerant of others, we suppress our initial instincts of aversion to other people, and we become nicer people. And all of this is coming out of research on people who practice different kinds of meditation, but especially mindfulness meditation. Now, uh, William James said uh, more than 100 years ago, the faculty of voluntar voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again in the very, is the very root of judgment, character, and will, and that every education should have this as a focus. And increasingly, students from K through 12 through university, and we have a, prog a program at my college, the Mindfulness Project at our college, uh, are being taught techniques for mindfulness training, yoga, uh, martial arts, meditation, other kinds of techniques, um, often completely secular outside of the context of any kind of religious indoctrination, as it has to be in the United States. Also, workers in different kinds of workplaces are being exposed to mindfulness training programs from corporate boardrooms, to police and nurses and teachers, to overcome burnout and the stresses that they face in their jobs. All kinds of employees are finding these to be useful programs. Soldiers are being trained in the US military how to meditate, both to improve their operational effectiveness in the situations that they're in, but also as a way to overcome post-traumatic stress after they've been in battle. Uh, this particular tool, BioZen, is an open source application that was developed to teach soldiers meditation techniques through neurofeedback and biofeedback uh, 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 tools that they can wear on their body that will measure the meditation that they're doing and show that, track their progress over time. I've been tracking this kind of technology for the last decade through our institute at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, we've been looking at neuroeth neurotheology, which is the uh, application of technology to uh, spiritual experience and also the measurement of spiritual experience with technology. So looking at meditators' brains under fMRI scans, um, looking at uh, genetic tendencies that people have to one sort of religious belief or spiritual experience or the other, but also the emerging question of moral enhancement, which is, how might we use these, uh, our growing understanding of neuroscience, of moral neuroscience, of social neuroscience, to uh, apply technology to improve moral sentiments, cognition, and behavior? 
in ways that are uh, an advance over the older kinds of uh, punitive ways that we've dealt with these problems in the past, ways that we can apply to ourselves. So there's a, a very uh, expanding field uh, of, as with the neuroscience begins to grow around these questions of how we might apply technologies. And of course, we've been applying technologies to the question of mindfulness and attention for thousands of years. We've had coffee, caffeine, hot, coca, chocolate, all kinds of drugs that uh, have been useful for waking us up and making us more attentive. And more recently, we have the stimulant medications that are used for attention deficit disorder um, and that are increasingly being used by uh, people who do not have attention deficit disorder as study aids. And then there are newer drugs, which are anti-fatigue drugs, which keep us awake and productive for longer periods of time and have fewer of the side effects of the attention deficit drugs. So these have an ancient provenance, these mindfulness drugs. We also have an increasing number of mindfulness apps, apps which can track your to-do list, your weight, uh, the number of steps you take. I wear one myself that traps, tracks my calorie burn during the day, um, and as well as the progress that you're making on your to-do list, whether you've been sitting too long, remind you to get up. Uh, you can have an app on your computer that locks out the internet and uh, locks out social media so that you focus on the things that you're doing. Um, and all of these are attempts to, uh, to deal with the distractions that are coming at us from this increasingly frenetic information environment and allow us to be more focused day to day. Wearable mindfulness, I think, also has an ancient provenance. We wear wedding rings, we wear priest collars that remind us and other people uh, in a moment-to-moment -moment way of the commitments that we've made and the kinds of behavior that we're supposed to engage in. Um, but also now we have these kinds of devices, wearable devices, which will tell us in a moment-to-moment -moment way, this device tells me moment-to-moment -moment how many steps I've taken, how many calories I've burned. And I think that in the future, these will get smaller and smaller and more and more integrated into our clothing, into our daily lives. And what that is headed towards is something called augmented cognition, which is the notion that we're going to have, we already have, consumer uh, EEG monitors that measure the amount of uh, focus that you have from your EEG um, and can feed that information directly back into interfaces like the Google Glass in, in the corner of your eye, telling you in a moment-to-moment -moment way whether you're focused or distracted, uh, excited or, or calm, and uh, depending on the situation you're in, you could be one or the other. Uh, the one on the right, by the way, this device, also measures uh, eye tracking. So it depends, it will measure how much focus you're actually giving to the thing that you're looking at versus looking at everything else. And all kinds of devices will be integrated in the future. You're going to hear about one in the next session, I know. The attention economy, however, is this very complex thing that has developed. Because on the one hand, it's developing all these things to distract us and to fragment and to blow up our attention in a thousand different ways. But on the other hand, workplaces are finding that they want us to be increasingly focused as workers. They want us not to be distracted because we're not as productive when we're distracted. Um, and so they're trying to teach us to focus at work, but in the marketplace, it's all the distraction. And of course, then mindfulness becomes a product as well. If people want mindfulness, it will become a product as well. And I think one of the things that we're called upon to do is to be a little critical of how the McMindfulness phenomena is playing out in the world right now. Mindfulness in the Buddhist tradition uh, was not simply paying attention to everything. There is a tradition, the Zen tradition, in which mindfulness was the beginning and ending of most questions. If you just paid attention, it was enough. One of the things that Zen led to was the samurai tradition, which was a group of warriors who used mindfulness techniques to fearlessly face death, but never to question authority, to be able to do whatever they were told to do. They were not questioning the situations they were in. They were not uh, applying the logic of compassion or right livelihood to the situations they were in. So we, we, what we're called to do with mindfulness is not just say, let's teach children how to use mindfulness to overcome the stresses in their schools. Let's change the schools as well. Let's make the schools different as well and empower children through the techniques of mindfulness to become change agents in the situations they're in. Let's not just teach soldiers to overcome PTSD. Let's also change the world of violence that causes PTSD. Let's not just teach workers to overcome workplace stress. 
Let's change the workplace as well. Mindfulness should not just be a technique used for pacification. It has to also be a critical technique. This is Vajra Dogini, a Tibetan meditation icon, and she's kind of a symbol of radical mindfulness. But you see at her feet, she has the embodiments of greed, hatred, and ignorance that she's stomping. Uh, it's a pretty powerful image, you know, to be meditating on, to say, I don't, I'm not just going to be passively mindful of the world, I'm also going to be actively engaged in stopping out greed, hate, hatred, and ignorance in the world. And one of the ways that mindfulness can, uh, can help us do this is it makes you increasingly aware of social dynamics, of the microaggressions of day-to-day -day life, of sexual tension, racial bias, I'm acutely aware whenever I'm around a man taller than me that there's an alpha male thing going on and I, I try not to you know, cringe and become subservient, subservient to the, the taller men or dominate the shorter men around me. There, all of these kinds of mindfulness can uh, make a more egalitarian, a more tolerant workplace, life, day-to-day -day experience if we uh, have that kind of critical mindset to it. I think of this also as a matter of intentional, attentional design. That is, Consciously thinking about what kinds of things we give our attention to during the course of every day, uh, how much of our day is consumed with celebrities and, and trivia and, and you know, the latest entertainment, which I have a lot of entertainment in my life and, uh, and I'm interested in some celebrities, um, but we also have to have a kind of conscious balance in our life about not just trying to pacify ourselves and make ourselves happy, but also pay attention to the problems of the world, pay attention to our responsibility as citizens. And one of the ways that that's manifesting now is that we can all have various kinds of apps, apps that uh, teach you about the news of the day, apps that connect you to politics and to various ca causes and movements and nonprofit organizations that we want to pay attention to and that we'll, we'll use to help improve the world. This is perhaps not going to make us that much happier to be paying attention to the problems of the world, but mindfulness will at least give us the conscious presence to make that decision that that is one of the things we're going to have in our daily attentional diet. So, my injunction today, uh, not too much of a sermon, I hope, is pay more attention, become ethically mindful, and finally, become dangerously mindful. Thank you.